Hey everybody, hope you're having a great day so far. I'm excited for the quarterly installment we have in partnership with Start a Brewery. We had a fantastic panel last week discussing almost anything taproom related. And today we're going to talk about trademark law for the craft brewer. But first, Laura, for everyone who hasn't heard of startabrewery.com yet, can you give us a rundown of what your big things you're doing over there with Candice? Absolutely. Um, fundamentally, our mission is to create a beer industry community to raise the education awareness of startups and, and simultaneously lower the bear for, barrier for those looking to live their dream. Um, it's really cool, though, to, to be partnering with Startup Brewery because we have, or sorry, with uh, craft beer professionals because we very much are, are both dedicated to providing information and keeping that free. And I think that that's uh, something that we've, we've worked hard to develop. Um, the Tuesday Talks last week was super cool, and um, we're really excited to to bring the focus today to trademarks and to look forward to maybe some more panels in the future definitely the quarterly um, educational seminar and just continuing this partnership going forward oh, so without forward further ado let me introduce my my partner and co-founder of start a brewery candace moon uh good afternoon uh it's uh early for me i know it's a little later for all, a lot of you guys on the east coast um but uh, my name is Candice Moon. I am uh, a craft beer attorney. Uh, I have been working with craft brewers for, oh my God, 13, 14 years now on various uh, aspects of uh, their businesses. Um, but a large part of my time, and certainly when I first started, was in the world of trademarks, um, which is always a very popular topic. It's, it's a great one to speak about because uh, it's the same nationally for everyone. There aren't, unless you're dealing with state trademarks, which is pretty rare. Um, this is the same information for everybody nationwide. So I'm going to dive in today. It's not going to be extremely in-depth, but I am totally open for questions. If um, I believe you can comment uh, along the way. Yep. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and if you need clarification on something I'm talking about at the moment, that is definitely a comment that would be great immediately. Any uh, more in-depth questions can uh, wait to the end. I definitely left time for questions. Um, and I'm happy to expand on anything I touch on. So with that said, I'll get started. Good luck, Candace. See you on the other side. Thanks. Oh, that's right. You guys are disappearing on me. I'm on my own now. Okay. Uh, so that's just my information uh, in case you want to reach out with any questions or comments after the presentation. Uh, I'm much better with the email, but there is a phone number there as well. Uh, of course, I have to give my legal disclaimer that nothing in this presentation should be considered official legal advice. Uh, trademarks, uh, like all law, is very fact specific and your situation can be very different from someone else's. So that said, uh, this is very general information. And if you have a specific legal situation, consult a licensed attorney uh, with the specific facts of your situation. Okay, so today's topics. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about what a trademark is. Uh, how do I know if someone else is already using a mark? Why should you file for a mark? And what are some best practices? And again, this is all very general. And there's always exceptions. I always feel the need to mention that. So uh, we can address those uh, uh, later on if, uh, if needed. Okay. So what is a trademark? So a trademark is anything that identifies the source of the product to the consumer. So the consumer sees a logo and knows... Uh, who makes that product. So for example, the gargoyle from Stone, Anchor from Anchor, my one of my new favorite brands, Athletic, uh, Allagash, and New Belgium, although I'm not sure if they're using the, that logo anymore. It might be a little old. I uh, borrowed all of these from the trademark database, which is why they're black and white. Um, but the idea is that you see this logo by itself and you know who makes that product. Uh, then there are also names. So when you see um, Boulevard, you know who makes that beer. 
Or theoretically, when you see, let's see if there's an interesting name here, Crimson Fog, PH, Red Ale, you would know that came from 23rd Street Brewery. So the name identifies the product source. And, oops, oh, oh yes. And the last one would be a combination of name and logo. So the whole picture. So uh, Arrogant Bastard Ale with the gargoyle. Um, the whole look and feel. So uh, why does the law care about trademarks? So the law, really, the whole point of trademarks is to protect consumers uh, from confusion. So seeing one name and then maybe um, thinking that it came from a different uh, source, so a different brewery or potentially a winery or a distillery, um, and as well as deception. So where people are purposely uh, trying to confuse consumers. So those are, I don't feel like I see those in uh, the craft beer world, but definitely um, I'm trying to think of some good examples, but it's kind of like, you know, your knockoff goods. If you're on the streets of New York and you see the fake Louis Vuitton uh, or the fake Prada, Prado, um, that kind of thing. So that's why the law cares. So they're not concerned. The law doesn't care about how much money you spent on your trademark, how much effort you've gone into to protect something. It's all about the consumers. So the, the most recent large controversy in terms of what is a trademark, um, uh, Stone versus Keystone. So as a lot of you, I suspect know, Keystone changed their branding. Uh, Previously, it was very obvious that it was Keystone, uh, Keystone Light. And <clears throat> they changed their branding where if the can was turned sideways, such as in this photo, uh, it just said Stone. And so Stone Brewing, obviously, was very concerned that there could be confusion if a consumer saw Stone, a can of Stone on the shelf, and they just see the word Stone, that it could be uh, one of their products. And so this was... Um, quite a big lawsuit. A lot of people uh, followed one of the few that actually went all the way through the process rather than settling. And Stone Brewing did indeed win this trademark suit. Um, and I think it's basically, it's not that you're going to confuse the two cans because obviously they're very different, but you know, a lot of when breweries rebrand, you know, you may not know when the rebrand looks like, and you just see the word stone it's very easy to think that that could come from stone brewing. So that's what we're looking for or what we're concerned about. So how can you avoid these potential issues? So when you come up with a name and I know um, in our startup brewery world, uh, that may be your brewery name uh, for a lot of folks who are already open uh, at this point, we're probably talking about beer names. So how do you clear the name? Well, what does clearance mean? Clearance is basically when you look at both uh, registered trademarks, uh, applications for trademarks, and use in the industry to determine, to make an assessment of your potential liability of using a particular mark. And so these are, I've kind of listed where you can look to see if someone else is using the name that you are interested in. So the trademark database, the USPTO, has a public database where you can go in and you can look through and see uh, what might be what is already registered, what's already been applied for, and therefore might be a block to your name. Um, you need to look at all alcoholic beverages because the trademark office, especially if you're looking to file for a trademark, the trademark office considers all alcohol the same. So they're going to compare your mark against uh, wineries, distilleries, et cetera, and a lot of times restaurants and bar services, uh, mainly because they find that a lot of restaurants do private labeling. So you're going to have to look for those things to see what your potential liability at the trademark office is going to be. Now, outside of the trademark office, you can look at your state trademark database to see if someone in your state um, or, I mean, and, and certainly all 50 states, you could check those databases. That's pretty extensive. Um, the TTB, when you are applying for a certificate of label approval, that is a public database. 
So you can go into the Cola database and check and see if there's a similar name. And again, that's also good because it will also cover all alcohol. Uh, and I know I mentioned wine and distilleries, and I guess I should also mention kombucha and seltzer and canned cocktails and all the other ciders and all the other beverages that uh, we are working with these days. Um, popular review sites. Untapped is a goldmine of beer names and brewery names that are out there in use or have been used. Um, probably more than you need to know, but it, again, kind of puts you on notice if you have chosen a name that is already used either by um, a larger brewery, which is obviously a bigger issue, or just, you know, a one location draft house on the opposite side of the country from you. And that is a less, um, less risk, but still a risk for you. And then of course, Google, which everyone uses Google, but what I've also found is when a lot of people Google the name, um, they're looking for an exact match and they really don't look beyond the first or second page. And so you've really got to go down, maybe not every page of the million results that come back from a Google search, but at least scan, I'd say the first 10 pages, uh, and also pay attention to anything that's similar. Uh, definitely if it's similar and on the same kind of goods. So we'll get to that also in a bit. Okay. So that's how you can kind of do your own clearance to some extent. You can also pay. There are companies that will do full clearance searches for you. Um, we offer clearance searches, clearance searches, uh, as well as any attorney that's filing trademarks offers should be offering that service. So what do you need to do a clearance? Well, the biggest reason to make sure that your mark is not too similar to someone else's is you want to avoid confusion, as is the law, among consumers by avoiding using someone else's mark or something that's too similar where people are going to get confused. Um, again, there's really no uh, objective way to determine if people are going to be confused um, until both products are out there and they actually are. Um, but keep in mind that being confused with someone else's mark, it's not good for either party uh, because the last thing you want is your beer reviewed under someone else's name, especially if it's great. You know, some, some other brewery is getting wonderful reviews because people are confusing your beer with their beer. Or, I mean, they may be getting one for reviews themselves, but you know what I'm saying. Um, the more unique a mark is, the stronger it is. And the stronger a mark is, you are entitled by law to more protection. So that's pretty important. So, And, and the strongest mark out there are made up words <laughs> that basically have nothing to do with your product and make it very, very unique. It's easier to register the stronger your mark is. Uh, things that have geographic names, surnames, descriptive marks, these are very difficult to register. Um, and there's a whole lot of caveats that go along with that um, that I can talk more in detail about later or you know, and in anyone's specific questions. But I'd say the biggest reason is to avoid litigation. And that's mainly because the cost of litigation is so ridiculously high these days. Uh, I will say that in the early days, my early days in this industry, uh, people were pretty non-litigious and it was a lot easier to settle these types of situations with a phone call and email, email. at worst case, a cease and desist. I mean, people were very... Um, willing to work with each other. But I would say, and certainly as we've become more of a mature business and we have bigger companies and there's more at stake, more people are going the litigation route. And I've even had two situations where instead of just threatening litigation, which is usually what you get, you know, you get a cease and desist and you say, uh, and then you get a letter saying, hey, cease and desist or I'm going to file a lawsuit. I've literally had two situations where they just went ahead and filed the lawsuit. And then you have to pay to respond. And it's, it's not good for anyone. It's expensive. It's stressful. Uh, 
And so the best way to avoid it is to just make sure you choose a name that no one else is going to come after you for. Okay. So do you make sure when you're doing this clearance, if you're doing it yourself, you've got to consider each word individually. You've got to, you can ignore generic words, brewing company. So if you have the same unique word and someone else has that word and brewing company, changing yours to be ale works does not help you because those words don't matter anyway. You're, you're going to have to disclaim them when you file. They don't count and they don't really count as a differentiator. You do need to consider other beverages. I mentioned wine, spirits, and other alcohol, but you also need to consider coffee, soda, water, and energy drinks. I've had all of those come back as blocks from the trademark office. However, some are arguable, some more than others, but I did see there was a case, and this was at the trademark office, not in court, about a winery, uh, one of the same name as a bottled water, and they the examiner had examples where uh, wineries would have private labeled bottled water. And that was enough to uh, keep this other winery from using uh, its unique name. So um, you need to consider all those things. So what are some of the solutions to conflicts? So if you do say, you know, let's say you do your clearance search and you see a name that is too similar to what you want to use. Um, check and check and see, is the other mark in use? Is it really being used out, uh, in the marketplace? Because if a mark has not been used in the market for over three years, trademark law considers it automatically abandoned. And then it's basically free for someone else to pick up and use. Now you may have to file a cancellation at the trademark office because marks last for, six years before someone has to do any filings and then uh, a full 10 years is the uh, registration period. So if someone's not using it, you may have to file a cancellation. And so sometimes it might even be worth offering to purchase it from somebody rather than having to cancel it. If you're sure they're not using it and have no plans to resume using it, um, then it's kind of a win-win for everyone. You're going to spend the money to cancel it anyway. They might get a little more money back in their pocket. Um, the others, what are the related goods for the other mark? Um, you know, are they planning to potentially expand from beer into spirits or spirits into beer? That's very common. Um, but sometimes if you guys can, if, if each party can determine their lane and agree to stay there, that, uh, can be a solution as well. I always recommend, well, I should. It's always good to speak to an attorney first to confirm what your rights are and your knowledge of the situation. But in terms of settling a conflict, I do recommend talking to the other party before sending a cease and desist. Now, the reason I gave that caveat is I have had clients who we received a cease and desist once from somebody claiming that they had prior rights when in fact my client that got the letter had the prior rights. So where they were like, please cease and desist from using that name in this state, we had the ability to go actually use cease and desist. So we didn't, we settled it, but you just want to be careful. You don't want to take a, a strong stance only to find out that you don't have the strong legal position. Now, even if you don't have the, the rights, let's say the other side does, that doesn't mean they might not be willing to let you use the name also, especially if we're talking different goods, wine versus beer. Because just because the trademark office considers all alcohol the same doesn't mean that consumers do or even other people in the marketplace. Um, it really just depends on what each of you are doing and what the plans are. Uh, you could also potentially... Um, get consent. And again, that's when you're going to have different goods, different markets uh, to avoid the confusion. Some people may try and license a name. I would, there I'd be a little cautious. I, licensing generally is when you have a really widely known mark and you let someone else use it on a different product. Uh, for example, um, I'm trying to think, Diesel, huge clothing brand. I bought a watch a diesel watch. It wasn't actually made by diesel. They had licensed their name to a watch company um, because their name had value. Um, you could acquire 
you can buy it from them. Maybe they're not even making that product anymore and their uh, mark is still live. Uh, worst case, legal proceedings. As I said, if, if you call and you can't work things out, I mean, there are some people who, you know, either feel so strongly that it's a problem or just maybe aren't easy to work with and don't want to make it easy for you. You may have to uh, go a more legal route. I would always start with a cease and desist letter. Here are trademark office proceedings. If you have the, um, the legal ground to file something, uh, you can always do try mediation, uh, especially if it's a, a strong dispute. I find that when it comes to trademarks, people tend to be very emotional rather than logical and making logical business decisions. Um, there's a lot of feeling of ownership um, that goes into names that and, and logos that people have created specifically for their brands. Um, so, and then there's always litigation, but as I have mentioned a couple of times, I don't recommend it. Um, uh, I always say the lawyers are the only ones who win in litigation. Uh, and I don't litigate by the way. So, so uh, why would you file for a trademark? Well, mainly because there are a lot of things that make people or that people believe give them trademark rights that don't. So here are all the things that do not give you rights to a name, the domain name, state business registration, social media pages. So, you know, you have the Facebook page and the Twitter and the Instagram and the TikTok and the YouTube channel. None of those things give you trademark rights. Use on goods that are given away, but not sold. So homebrew does not give you trademark rights. Use on other goods. So your brewery is not open yet, but you've made t-shirts, which you've sold. That does not give you trademark rights for beer. And it actually doesn't even give you trademark rights for t-shirts, but that's kind of another, uh, that's another topic that I'll talk about later if anyone wants to hear about it. So I want to talk about, and this was uh, in the news years ago, but it, it, it's kind of the perfect example. Uh, there was a brewery called Narwhal. Uh, they were New York home brewers, a brewery and planning. They launched their Facebook page in, in December of 2010. They registered their uh, name as an LLC with the state of New York. They had the Twitter account. They had the Instagram. They had t-shirts. They won homebrew competitions. And all of these things are great. And they are arguably a way to build a brand. And you, you could argue that there is a trademark value to this, but technically none of those things give you trademark rights. And so they ran into a problem with another brewery um, and ended up basically because they didn't have the rights they thought they had. Actually, and here's the real, the real kind of uh, downfall is they, they thought they had the rights because of all these things they had done. And they basically went after the other brewery that had actually named a beer and sold a beer with this name on it only to find out they didn't have the legal standing. They thought they did. And then the other brewery wasn't real happy to work. It wasn't really, um, in the, in the mindset to work with them at that point after they'd kind of come after them. So Narwhal, changed their name and is now Finback Brewery uh, and actually doing really well, loves their name. You know, it, it was a tough lesson learned, but so there are only two ways to gain trademark rights in a, in a mark. So whether it be a logo, a name, et cetera. Uh, so number one is use on the specific goods for sale. And I, I break that up because you have to have all three of those. So if you're trying to protect the name on beer, which by the way, should probably be the most important thing you're trying to protect, you have to use it on beer product for sale. All three. You can't um, use it on t-shirts, as I mentioned, uh, putting it on homebrew, which you can't sell, uh, doesn't work. Uh, and you do have to actually put it on those goods. Uh, that is one way to gain trademark rights in a name or in a mark. And on and and to some extent that's valid, but keep in mind you'll only gain and own those rights where you have used that mark. So that is very location specific uh, and geographic. Um, and then the second way is to register it. And that's again, um, 
easier probably. And you can definitely file for registration before you've used um, the mark on goods for sale. And you actually have from the day you file, you have up to three and a half years basically to, to use it. Um, and par- right now the trademark office is really behind on reviewing marks. And that's actually a bonus because that actually probably gives you an additional six months to that, that number. Um, so when you gain your rights by using it, your ownership is established for actual use. You don't have to register it. If you do stop using it, the mark will be considered abandoned and available for others. And that is not that three year limit. That is just in general. So if you stop using it for any amount of time and I'm not, I mean, I'd probably say six months per year. I mean, that's, you're going to have a guesstimation as to how long, like if you don't make a beer for, if it, it's a seasonal and it's you make it every year. I think that would count as actual use and regular use because it's a seasonal. So kind of use just kind of your best judgment and what makes sense in those situations. So you can use the little TM uh, symbol that is a symbol for trademarks that are unregistered. So I'm using this name. I'm using it on a regular basis to identify that this is my product, but I don't have a registration. And it is infringement for someone else to use it or to use the same or a confusingly similar term within the same geographic area or, and in some cases, a natural area of expansion. So I'll, I'll go into that a little more in a moment on the natural area of expansion, but those trademark rights exist only as far as that first user has already extended his trade under that mark. So that's only good for where you've used it or possibly a natural area of expansion. So you can have a second user that acquired the rights, the same name, the same product in a different market. So California versus New York, for example, theoretically. And that's if both are just relying on use to protect their rights. Okay. So I'm going to um, go into another kind of case study, which was a few years ago as well. But this is there. I haven't seen another situation like this where um, Oasis, this brewery, Texas, sold beer under the name Slow Ride uh, in their town. So they gained common law rights for using it where they were um, before um, New Belgium filed. Uh, for a trademark. And New Belgium had filed for a trademark. I, I'm going to guess that they did a clearance, but somehow things get missed. No clearance is perfect. So it got missed, filed a trademark, um, but Oasis was already using it as a beer name. And then, oh, where'd my little, there we go. What happened? Lawsuit. Um, I don't, I, mean, I don't know the ins and outs. I don't know what went on before, but eventually Oasis did file a lawsuit to sue New Belgium to uh, over the rights to the trademark. Outcome, Oasis won. The court said that Oasis owns that name in Texas. However, New Belgium owns it everywhere else. So Oasis owns it first. They used it first. They used it, and I, I apologize, I don't remember where in Texas they're based. The court took their town and gave them the natural area of expansion for the whole state of Texas. Uh, I don't believe they were selling it all over Texas yet. Um, But then New Belgium owned it everywhere else based on their trademark filing. So New Belgium can't sell it in Texas under that name because of Oasis, but they can sell it everywhere else. And Oasis only paid $200,000 for the rights to this beer name in Texas. And so again, litigation, you may win, you may be in the right, but is it worth it? And in the long run, especially for that amount of money, you know, is a beer name that important? Um, I do believe New Belgium eventually changed the name of that beer anyway, so they could sell it nationally without having to um, worry about treading uh, on Oasis's toes. But um, that's just what you really want to think about. And that's where, again, this is one of those situations, I think, emotional decision more than business decision necessarily. So uh, it is federal trademark law when you file for a federal trademark, uh, which is why this applies to everybody. If you are doing a state mark uh, that would be specific to your state, your state only, and there may be situations where that makes sense. 
but you do have to use the mark honor in connection with goods across state lines, which is a lot easier when you're not alcohol and you can just ship stuff. Uh, so we have a little bit more of a um, hurdle to get to the across state lines. I will say that um, you don't have to sell it across state lines. Uh, I, and, and there are some attorneys that kind of interpret this differently, but I take a pretty conservative line on this. I will say that um, I think that as long as it's a public use across state lines, you can finalize your registration uh, and still meet the intended requirements of a federal registration. So in other words, if I have people who aren't distributing across state lines, I recommend festivals, competitions, anything where there is a public use of the name in another state. I have had people who weren't open yet, but did collaborations in two different states um, so that their mark was on product for sale in two different states. So for a federal trademark, two different states is kind of the key. Uh, you do have a, a decent amount of time to get that going, but uh, I have had people who have filed fairly early uh, and either got to the end of that three years and hadn't opened yet or just wanted to go ahead and get it taken care of. So although you have up to three years, the trademark office is going to basically hit you up every six months for an additional fee to keep that application alive if you have not crossed state lines yet. And then I think everybody's probably familiar with the circle R, which is the symbol for federally, federally registered trademarks. Um, benefits, national protection. So even if you just used it in two states, federal registration protects you nationally. Um, it is publicized to others, which basically puts everyone else on notice that you are using that name on beer product. Uh, after five years, you can file for something called incontestability, which means that if someone has actually used it before you, but doesn't contest your trademark for five years after registration, you can basically file so that they, they can't come after you. The law basically says if there haven't been problems for these five years has been registered, it shouldn't be a problem. And therefore you can get incontestability. Uh, having a registration promotes settlement because there's less to argue. You have the proof that it was filed, that you've used it, uh, et cetera. Uh, and it's, it's evidence in court should you need it. So people always ask when they should file for a trademark. And my feeling on this is you should file when you are invested, whether it's financially, as in you have just bought a ton of cans, you're planning to distribute it pretty wild, widely, um, you bought a bunch of labels, et cetera, uh, or emotionally, as in it would break your heart if you couldn't use this mark anymore more because someone sent you a cease and desist. Um, I had one client who said that he actually did file trademarks for almost all his beer names, not so he could go after other people, but so that no one could come after him and tell him to stop using a name. So uh, investment, uh, I would say this, and especially for the starter brewery folks, uh, startups who haven't done this at all yet, is your brewery name is probably the most important thing you can trademark. Um, I think beer names, beer names come and go. Beer names are also, I mean, I know when I, so I used to bartend at a craft beer bar. And if we had two beers with the same name, we would just add the brewery name to the beer name. And then that differentiated but that brewery name, it really is something you really don't want to have the exact same brewery name as someone else. Um, so that's really going to be your most important trademark. Second is a logo. Um, I say the name first because I do think a lot of people can accidentally choose the same name, even though I know we all think we're super creative when, you know, coming up with those hop puns. Uh, everybody kind of, you know, there's a possibility. I think the likelihood of someone accidentally having the same logo, less likely, but if you plan to use a big hop butt in your logo, that is going to be very common. Um, but so the logo second, and then um, if you're going to have a tagline, that's another one you might want to consider. Um, beyond that, beer names, I said, 
flagship beer, you know, that's probably the most important. But keep in mind, as I mentioned, you need to cross state lines. And when you're getting to that point, you need to be crossing state lines on a regular basis. So your brewery name probably does because you go to GABF, GABF every year. You send a World Beer Cup every other year. You go to a festivals every festival season. Beer names, not so much. And I so I would really um, kind of pick and choose and cherry pick which of those you spend the time and money on the trademark. So best practices. Uh, consider all the areas you want to protect. So like I said, beer, number one. I would say the second thing you want to protect is bar services, which is a class... So that's the same class as restaurants and bars. And so by filing a trademark in that class of goods, uh, which should be protected already, as I think I mentioned, I do get a lot of pushback from the trademark office on restaurants and bars. Um, the last thing you want is a bar opening with a similar name to your brewery name, uh, especially if it's in the same geographic area, uh, because then people might just think you opened a second tap room. And that definitely happened to one of my clients. So um, clothing can, can be a good third, especially if you plan to be selling a lot of clothing. Um, I will say that you cannot get a clothing trademark until you already have that beer trademark or the bar services. Clothing, your name on clothing, because you're not a clothing manufacturer, would be considered a secondary mark because it's secondary to your main business of selling beer or serving beer. And same for glassware. I mean, and the one thing I, I tell people is that the larger you get, the more classes you probably want to file in because you really want to shore up your mark. You want to make it as difficult as possible for someone to cancel your mark. So the more classes you're in, that would be the more filings they would have to do. Um, and especially if you are selling a lot of merch, um, it's, it's a great way to protect that. And then you want to consider all the marks you want to um, protect. So your brewery name, uh, your logo, a tagline, and then possibly beer names. Research your marks as thoroughly as possible before committing to them. I, I will say that a lot of times my clients have already committed to the mark before they call me to file it or clear it. But ideally, if you can do as much research before committing or at least committing to labels, you'll be in good shape. If, if, if it's a draft only beer, that's pretty easy to change. Should you get a cease and desist or there be a problem? It's a, you know, especially if it's a handwritten keg collar, if it's written on a chalkboard, easy fix. If you've purchased a whole bunch of labels or cans, that's a whole different situation. Uh, I'm a big fan of, you know, put yourself in the other person's position when considering if a mark is confusing, I have people always ask me, so is this infringement? Is this infringement? And my answer is generally, well, if you were first and someone else came out with that name, would you, you know, feel like you were infringed? Uh, and that's just really the best way because it is not black and white. I mean, it can be, but it's rarely black and white. Um, try to take emotion out of the equation as I mentioned, talk to the other party before bringing in a lawyer, although it is good to be 100% of your legal standing and rights before you make that phone call. Realize that settling your differences now will save both parties time, money, and stress. Uh, I mentioned this because most trademark um, conflicts settle. They they. A lawsuit might be filed. They go down that road. They all, both sides spend a ton of money. And then somebody is like, I, I can't deal with this anymore. I can't spend any more money. It's too expensive. We've got to settle this. And I will almost guarantee you that people end up settling probably what they would have settled at in the beginning before all the time, money and stress, if they had just kind of taken a deep breath and sat down and done it. So as well, realize that at some point in time, you will be on the other side of this. You're either going to be making that phone call or you're going to get that phone call. Um, so be as easy to work with as you can. Most people are, are very understandable. Um, most situations you make the phone call. I'm sure you didn't realize this, but we actually have that bear name trademarked. Can you change it on your next run? And most people, no problem. So sorry, didn't mean to, didn't realize it. 
again, you know, it's a, it's a big industry with lots of people. Um, so just like I said, keep in, keep in mind that you will also be the one getting the phone call and the easier you make it on the other person to say yes and to, to cease using that mark, the, the easier it'll be. And if you can't work it out, try and consider mediation rather than litigation. Um, I, I think mediation is less expensive from the aspect of um, what it costs and the fact that it doesn't last nearly as long as litigation. So mediation may be a few couple hour sessions and not cheap, but a whole lot cheaper than litigation, which as a, the slide I showed earlier, the average litigation is $400,000. So, and again, that's all going to the attorneys. And that is the end of the presentation. Um, I am open to questions. I'm happy to uh, dig in deeper on anything. Um, if we're going to, uh, well, two o'clock my time, we've got just under 20 minutes left. Uh, so happy to see what anyone has to, to say or has questions about. Great stuff, Candice. I always enjoy learning from you. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. I'm sure Lori can help pick your brain as well. Is there anything about trademarks in craft beer that's surprising you right now? It could be a situation, you know, you witnessed between two breweries or anything unique from your perspective that you found just surprising. I'd say recently it's been more people willing to litigate. And I don't know if it was in some, you know, aspects, the fact that Stone did and that kind of, and there was so much press around that and that kind of woke people up a little bit. Or if it's just, we're a more mature industry, there's more at stake, uh, more business people involved. Um, not, I, I, I'm not sure why. But I am seeing more litigation. And as I said, I've had two where you didn't even get the threat. The, literally, we just got the, the service of the summons, which was kind of crazy because that's not cheap. I'll give you a follow up to that one, too. I think, Laura, you might have actually been on this panel a while back where we debated whether or not craft beer was as collaborative as it once was or there's a little bit more competition going on. Candace, it sounds like you might be saying there's more competition between breweries these days and a little less willingness to collaborate. You know, I'm not saying that. I think for the larger breweries, there's more at stake. So I don't know that they're less willing to collaborate as much as because there are shareholders or, or you know, people that have invested in them that they have to protect their interests and protect their intellectual property, which does have value, especially if they are going to plan to potentially sell someday, depending on what their exit strategy is. Um, I would say that we're growing up as an industry and people have to, and I don't want to say be more professional, but I think there's certain things that you have to be more strict about uh, and more, and, you know, kind of like the bigger companies. And so you have more people coming in the industry that have done business in other companies. I'd say we're, I definitely feel like that versus a lot of the mom and pops, which, I mean, we still have that as well. And I think people want to be collaborative, but I also think sometimes you've got the smaller, newer breweries who may not completely understand the value of intellectual property. So you've got the bigger brewer or someone who's been around for a while who really has to protect. I mean, I've definitely had people like even someone's brewery name, you know, so I had one client who called a small brewery that was using a, their brewery. So client's brewery name was being used as a beer name by the small brewery draft only, but same state. And the small brewery was like, deal with it. It's like, wait, that's my brewery name. Like, you know, it's, you know, I think when you have two beer names across this country and they're both in like their own markets, you know, less, less of a big deal. But, and it was just kind of like, I think my client was just frustrated that this other brewery just didn't understand how important that, that was. And, and interesting enough in the meantime, and that was a couple of years ago, but my client sold his brewery 
And that's one of those things that is really important to either when you're doing a capital raise and trying to bring on investors or sell to another company is that you have protected your intellectual property. And it doesn't mean being a jerk and telling everyone and their brother, hey, you can't do that, you can't do that. But it's like I said, Candace, I think your audio may have gone out there for a second. Laura, are you there? I am. I'm here. Everybody, it appears Candace is frozen. We're going to give her a second to come back and answer all your burning trademark related questions. I actually have a situation that I can share in the meantime. Um, a lot of distribution contracts now, and I haven't seen this necessarily previously, a lot of distribution contracts are requiring that the trademarks be in place for all of the uh, beer names and for the, the brewery names that they're distributing. So I'm seeing more and more that the, the distributors and the contracts between the brewery and the distributor are specifying that those trademarks are necessary in order to move forward. Otherwise, you know, you're getting them in trouble too. So I think that that's been interesting to watch as well. Candace, are you back? I'm back. Sorry. I don't I have the greatest Candace. internet. <laughs> It held up though. I think one of the interesting things, Candace, is that um, the, the breweries that are trying to protect their intellectual property get such a bad name and such a bad rap of, you know, you're the big bad guy because you're trying to protect um, your, your, your property, your, your rights, your business. And I don't know if there's any way to, to really uh, stop that kind of, um, reputation is there any way to to soften that or educate more around that um again i think it's just going to be the the newer breweries either experiencing it themselves <laughs> where you know all of a sudden someone comes along and uses their name and they're not so happy about it and then they have to be the one making that phone call but i mean social media makes it tough i mean that's what happened with narwhal they went on social media and blasted the other brewery Ooh. and then only to then find out they didn't actually have the rights. At mm -hmm. which point the other brewery was like, yeah, we're not really conducive to working with you based on what you, you just went and called us the big bad guy and we're trying to, you know, so I think it's just, again, that's why I really uh, um, emphasize consider the reverse position. Think of it the other way. Like you're right now you're going, Oh, that's not a big deal. But let's say you're distributing all over the state. Now, if someone were to do it to you, is, is it a big deal now? Mm -hmm. And then it's just, I think people fly off the handle. I think social media makes it way too easy again. And I think it's the emotion is part of it. So yeah, I think it's fun that, um, that you get to be called the dream crusher sometimes, but I think it also Killer. reflects, Dream, Dream killer. killer. <laughs> you're not, you're not professor. Um, but I think it reflects on the amount of time and energy that people are are putting into it. And I think that maybe they need to work a little harder before they really set their hopes and dreams on something. Agreed. And I will also say, I think that a lot of the marketing companies out there make that difficult too, because they always try to convince people to do things that are descriptive, which is not very true, remarkable. And it makes it tough. So I do see a comment by the way. Excellent. Um, whether to trademark all beer names or just flagships. I mean, you, you certainly can trademark all beer names, but I would only, I would only trademark what you, what you are consistently going to be sending across state lines and by consistently at least once a year, um, those beers, because I think otherwise, um, you're going to, you're going to have a hard time protecting a mark for a, a beer you sent across state lines once and that you're only selling locally. So um, now granted, you'll keep that trademark as long as, you know, until you get to the 10 year having to, to renew it, saying that you're still using it consistently across state lines. Um, and it certainly will discourage other people from using the same name. Um, but again, I don't know if you want to spend that much money. Uh, flagships make sense again, because, you know, those are going to be your most important beers. And it, it's just a whole kind of level of what's most important down to least important. How much money do I want to spend? Um, and that kind of thing. If you have a fun name that you really, really want to use, 
Um, if you put it on draft and you can take it away instantaneously, that's kind of a fudge zone question mark. Well, yeah, because so if you name actually, and the same goes for, although I think there's a fine line in this, um, you know, cans that are a limited release. Uh, generally you'll get the cease and desist and if all the beer has gone or you can change the name immediately, it's no big deal and you'll avoid a lawsuit. Now I will say this for the, the folks who do like some major trademark infringement for those limited release cans, uh, as long as you don't infringe the same company repeatedly, you can probably get away with it. But, uh, at some point, uh, if you hit up the same one over and over again, they might, those big companies tend to have a lot of money and be able to file lawsuits whether you want them to or not you don't want to you don't want to tick anyone off <laughs> too much especially <laughs> anyone with deep pockets i hate it's it's not fair but unfortunately candace i know a lot of the starter brewery audience is people you know dreaming of starting a brewery you know and outside of being a dream crusher dream killer whatever you know laura called you that mean word you know for anyone who's in the stages of getting ready to open you know what's something you believe they should do right now after listening to this session uh, I would, if you haven't already cleared and trademark your brewery name, you got to do it. And clearance is key. And you need, once you've cleared it and you've determined that it's clear and you're, uh, comfortable with the risk, you need to file it. So I've definitely had lots of people who are like, well, it was clear when I picked it and then they didn't file it. And I'm like, people, this stuff happens every day. Like, don't, don't slack on that. That's important. File it as soon as you get it cleared. Definitely an important one. Laura, is there anything else you'd like to throw at Candace? No, I think one of the things that we hear the most often, though, that I think is worthy of repeating is, is to make sure that you bring some of these questions to people who understand the industry. Um, uh, the, the, the person that, that handles your um, you know, other, other business interests may not necessarily know craft beer or alcohol. And that's no slight to them. You know, the attorney can't know all things everywhere. Um, so I think it's really important to talk to somebody who has some experience with, with the alcohol legislation and all of the ins and outs of things. And they're not going to be offended if you reach out to somebody who does trademarks for craft beer all the time for that thing. I mean, and that's very true because keep in mind, whatever you're going to put on a, a label that's going across state lines, you're going to have to get TTB approval for that. And so the last thing you want to do is trademark something that TTB is not going to let you use. And my one example isn't actually work anymore because they've changed their mind on it. But so when I started, uh, TTB would not allow you to put the word strong on a beer label. Um, and I had a client who had filed a trademark for uh, a strong ale and called it, a, a, you know, that was part of the trademark. And I'm like, you can't, I mean, you can sell it in your state, but you can't send that across state lines. You're not going to get accepted. Now, TDB has reversed the strong uh, situation, but there's definitely other things you've got to know. And, and one thing, even a trademark attorney, if they don't deal in alcohol, make sure, and you, you can tell them this, but they need to know that the trademark office considers all alcohol the same. Because I've had people come and go, oh, well, there's a winery, but, you know, nothing for beer. And I'm like at the trademark office, it doesn't matter. Well, it appears we don't have any more questions right now, but Candace, for anyone else who is interested in reaching out, following this with something they may think of after the fact, what's the best way to contact you? Email. <laughs> I get phone calls. I try to return them. Same with text, but email is by far the best way to reach me. Uh, and uh, it's in the presentation, I think at the front and at the back. Uh, it's pretty easy to remember, I think, Candace at craftbeerattorney.com. And actually, uh, I have a couple of articles on trademarks, specifically on choosing a name and clearance on the Starter Brewery website. So you can find information there as well. Awesome. And thank you for sharing so much valuable information today, Candace. Like I said, I always enjoy learning from these sessions. So <laughs> thank you for that. And for everyone who you know is watching, both Starter Brewery and Craft Beer Professionals have a plethora of 100% free resources you can access. If you're probably watching this on YouTube right now, feel free to go to the archives, nearly 500 sessions from the brewing to business side. And Laura, what can they expect on your website? Uh, well, in our 
channel of YouTube, we have all of our resource groups. So there's information there. And then on um, Start a Brewery, we have both the contributors list. If you have some specific questions, you can also find Candace's information there. Um, you can dig into the, the general category page. If you're looking for something legal, you'll find a lot of information about uh, legal topics there. Um, but you can also dive straight into the library and find uh, a, just a ton of information um, that you can dive into on all sorts of different issues there. So um, we're, we're super excited to, to have this particular presentation in, on both our channel and the Craft Beer Professionals channel and YouTube. And uh, we'll build that part of the library going forward. Looking forward to it. Well, Candice, Laura, always a pleasure to see you both. Everybody else, have a great day and good luck out there. Cheers. Thank you, Andrew. Bye.